Let's get, get, get. Yeah. Turn, turn, turn it up. You are now tuned into the Hustle Ninjas Podcast. All right. All right. All right. Yo, what's up? My name is Rich. Welcome to the Hustle Ninjas podcast, where we're going to be talking about all things entrepreneurship. For most of y'all who are tuning in, it's probably typically tuning in from the YouTube channel, Hustle Ninjas, where we mostly talk about e com, we talk about apparel, we talk about branding. But on this channel right here, this podcast, we're going to pretty much talk about all things entrepreneurship. I don't care if you turn $5 into $50 or you know, 50 grand to 50 mil. We're going to talk about it. And on this episode right here, I believe this is the first episode of Hustle Ninjas. I got a special guest with me. I got Blake with me. What's up, so Blake? What up? How you doing, man? Uh, I'm, I'm doing quite well. I'm excited to be here, especially considering it's the first episode. Yeah, man. I appreciate you for stopping by. You want to let the people know who you are? Yeah, man. I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur, for lack of better terms. Um, I've owned a, a fortunately successful clothing brand for over a decade called Popular Demand. And, and now, as well as owning that, I do uh, both advising and creative directing, uh, whether it's on certain projects or with certain companies. So I'm very fortunate because I get an opportunity to, uh, to do a lot of things as well as be an entrepreneur, which it sounds like that's, uh, that's who a lot of your audience, a lot of your audience are entrepreneurs or their goal is to become an entrepreneur. So I really connect with that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and outside of entrepreneurship, man, you're a great friend and advisor because I remember the first time hopping on a call with you, man, you instilled like so much confidence in me that, you know, I was just doubting myself. I was starting your channel and, you know, it was starting to get traction, but you were just like applauding me. So I appreciate you for Yo, that. Yo, I'll, I'll tell you when it comes to that, though, man, number one is some confidence in terms of being when you're an entrepreneur, uh, sometimes blind confidence in a way, but confidence is so vital. Um mm -hmm. Because it's hard to, to be successful, um, whatever you gauge as success, without really believing in yourself. But at the same time, you could keep doing the podcast and uh, keep trying to believe as much as you can in, in yourself. But sometimes it's good to hear it from somebody else, whether it's somebody who's accomplished some things or whether it's just a person who listened to your podcast and was like, Rich, I love when you're talking and like, take that and believe in it because man, being a, and I'm sure you've experienced this. You're very much an entrepreneur. We were talking about it before where this, I mean, shit to make content and to do that full time, to have a family for somebody like me, I, I I'm inspired by it. But, um, for anybody starting anything, man, it is hard. Being an entrepreneur can be difficult. So if somebody gives you a compliment, make sure to take it, take that, pocket it, and bring it along. You know, don't build up that ego too much. But at the same time, oh, yeah, I'm not talking sure. about you specific, <laughs> not you, not you, <laughs> but people in general. But still, if it helps you boost your confidence, and I'm not just saying from our conversation, I'm talking about to any entrepreneur, do those things. Listen to people when they give you some positive feedback. And yo, you're a super talented guy. So, I, like I said, I feel honored to be here. By the way, I like your hat. I just noticed that uh, <laughs> the Hawks hat you were wearing. So I fuck yeah. with it. Appreciate it, man. All right. So speaking of entrepreneurship, can we talk about you and your humble beginnings? Yeah, man. I've been an entrepreneur off and on. Uh, fortunately, now it's only been on for a long time. But I've been an entrepreneur off and on since I was in my early 20s. Actually, I remember starting a business or trying to start a business when I was like six, uh, 17, 18 years old. Um, and um, it was, it didn't go well at all, but I remember that experience from years ago. And so I've, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. I think part of it is just, I like to do my own thing. I believe in myself. So it's partly based on that. Um, but once you become an entrepreneur and somebody who, um, both sets the rules, uh, makes your own hours, which sounds, uh, a lot more exciting than it is because there's a lot of hours involved. But once you have that level of flexibility, once you have that ability to um, really make a massive difference in the specific thing you're working on that's literally tied to you, it's tough to go back. It's tough to not continue to do that. So for me, I don't see a time in my life where I won't be an entrepreneur uh, uh, with something. At the same time, uh, I've enjoyed advising uh, and uh, creative directing with 
groups of people as well because I've learned a lot working with a lot of talent the last few years. For sure. You're definitely creative, man. Can, can you give me a little bit about how you started Popular Demand? Because I've definitely seen it in Zoomies before. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I, you know, I, there's a uh, romantic story, of course, like, oh, this happened and this happened, this happened. But honestly, there's so many speed bumps when you start anything. And the reason why I started Popular Demand is because I was living in L.A. I had started another business. I'd moved out here from Boston. Mm -hmm. I started another business. That business did not go as well as I had hoped. I went through all of my life savings and I wanted to stay here in LA. I felt I had some unfinished business. I didn't really have an interest in going back to Boston um, for a lot of reasons. I didn't feel there was something there for me. And I also didn't feel that I felt I had, like I said, unfinished business, figure something out out here. And so uh, I always just like the term popular demand. So I, I, uh, I trademarked it a few years before I ever used the name. And so I trademarked this name and I'm a designer as well. I'm a creative. So when things weren't going well with, with this other business, I started developing some shirts. I had, I had worked at a place called Karma Loop before where I had started a thing called Karma Loop TV and Karma Loop Casba. But Casba gave me an opportunity to work with hundreds of up and coming brands, probably a hundred plus. And so I learned uh, some of the trials and tribulations with some of those brands. And um, I'd been in fashion for years. That's what my other business was, a fashion-based business. It just wasn't a brand. So I just started kind of hacking away and designing stuff. And I had a couple big, um, whether you call them North Stars, tent poles, whatever it is with popular demand, which was I'm going to make it loud and impossible to ignore. And um, I'm going to uh, try to make it big in L.A. And mm -hmm. so and then the other thing, which was not as uh, exciting, but became very exciting is I'm going to try to sell this to boutiques who've never heard of me before. And I put together a little line sheet. Um, we uh, we'd never made the product before. And we made a few samples of something, but we put together a line sheet that looked fortunately very good um, in terms of. Uh, through my background of design and understanding uh, just building brands, um, building things, because I'd done it before, that we'd send, I, we sent off this line sheet and I was the guy on the phone. I was the guy calling all of these different retailers, uh, trying to convince them to carry my line. And obviously way more, way, way, way more retailers said no than yes. But we got in some and um, uh, it worked. And people started buying the product and, and, you know, the biggest piece of advice I would give to any brand, but any brand that's trying to sell to retailers is uh, kind of something that I think is important for me to share, especially to your audience uh, because I think it's a really different way of looking at things. Uh, when most people design products and design brands, they oftentimes design it for themselves they mm -hmm. like, so if you ask them, why is it called this? Oh, that's the month yeah. of my birthday. This. Okay, <laughs> why is it? Why is your, your pop color orange? Oh, man, you know, when I was growing up, I was always a fan of Syracuse. Okay, cool. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do stuff that personally matters to you. But at the end of the day, that is a, that's a hobby, right? At the end of the day, you are trying to make a deal with somebody. You are trying to build a relationship with somebody saying, I'm going to, I have a shirt here. And I'm going to, I want money for it. So we're going to exchange that, but they got to feel on their side that they're getting something of value. So what I thought of uh, early on, this was just kind of tunnel vision with this, which was, I'm sure you have been in a lot of boutiques and you walk in and on a lot of those, there's tables of uh, products like folded t-shirts, stuff like that. Still, you know, 10 years ago, it was that way. You'll still see that in tons of retailers today. So my mindset was at the time, the biggest brands were obviously Nike and Adidas, but also Billionaire Boys Club, also the hundreds, also Crooks and Castles. These brands were very big. So my, my mentality was very straightforward. When you walk into that retailer, there's a kid there. And that kid I knew had never heard of popular demand. This is 10 years ago. I knew that it hadn't been out yet. So I knew that kid was going to, I pictured that kid had 30 bucks in his pocket. He worked all week. He was taking his girl out that night. 
going to the club. He was going to a birthday. I don't know what he was doing. But that kid needed one good shirt. He needed a shirt for the night. So what most people will do is think, I'm going to make something cool and somebody's going to buy my stuff. All right, cool. But what I was thinking was, okay, they walk up and there's a table. And they see the hundreds. Oh, they know the hundreds. They've worn the hundreds a few times. They see Diamond su- Supply Company. Oh, their skater friends have always wearing that. That's a cool brand. They see Crooks and Castles. Oh, yeah, I love Crooks. I got Crooks. Nike. They got Nikes on their feet. All these brands they're familiar with. And then they saw popular demands. And so that was my play. What the play was, I need them not to buy only buy popular demand. I have to somehow convince them, ah, uh, yeah, okay, the hundreds. Is, oh, what is this? I've never seen this before. And I had to convince them that they had $30. They had to pass on all that stuff they loved or connected with and take a chance on us. So the products were developed to be loud, to be unignorable, because I knew most of the people, six, seven, eight out of 10 of those people wouldn't make that decision to buy popular demand. They would have bought the hundreds. They would have... But a couple of them would, because they're like, yo, I've never seen this brand before, but it's wild. I'm going a, I'm to a try this out. So that was, to this day, I always try to take in consideration into consideration the choices that people get to make and with their hard-earned money. And the choices are oftentimes turning down something to buy something else. And so you got to make something that's so compelling that connects with somebody on such a quick visceral level that they're willing to turn down their knowns to buy an unknown. Mm. And that, um, I genuinely believe of all of the things I could explain that I did to start my brand, I think that mentality, I did a lot of stuff called the stores, I, right. all the right things. We did a lot of great stuff. But that mentality was the thing that I think allowed me to create a brand that cut through because I knew you couldn't just buy everything and you had mm. to make it, you had to literally turn down that to get this. And I got to make something that makes somebody be like, man, I don't know what this is, but if I wear this out tonight, I, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try right. it. Like that, that's <laughs> what I'm picturing. I'm literally visualizing it. Yeah. It, changed, it literally changed my life. The ability to uh, somehow, and yeah, it goes back to one thing that, that we talked about offline before. Getting into a store is exciting. High fives. It's cool. Being in a store for three months, six months, two years, that's the business. The business yeah. is maintaining being in stores. That's how you make real money. Getting in stores is a test. Mm-hmm. Pass the test or not. And then you got to pass it again and pass it again with your next line. Pass it again. And you'll learn that real quickly when you own a brand and you get it into a bunch of stores and then they don't place reorders. I fortunately didn't have that with popular demand. It worked from the jump. Right. That was dope. I, I was literally visioning like myself as a kid. Like you literally put yourself in the shoes of a customer and seeing like their wants and needs. That's dope, man. Um, I know this channel, this audience is very step by step. So I do got to put a pin in something. I know you said you only had a few yeah. samples made and you were already calling these stores and you know, you only had a line sheet. So you didn't have any inventory, anything in production. No. So I felt that I had the talent to be able to make the thing look larger than life through visuals, through some photos, through uh, Photoshop stuff, that it looked great and it looked real. Meaning that if a retailer saw me, they wouldn't look at the line sheet and be like, yeah, this is cool. These are all mock-ups. Do you have it? It looked like real shirts. So yeah. we, we did a tremendous job with that. But the key was this. So we sent out line sheets bunch of people placed a bunch of orders and my delivery date was for example july 1st right Mm -hmm. so i'm making sure though of a couple things yeah i didn't have the samples but as soon as those actual production pieces hit the floor like actually deliver to the store number one the retailer's happy oftentimes if they don't even notice anything that's just as good because they love the shirt when they bought it so if they get in like oh it looks great but what I needed to make sure was that if the shirt was delivered, if the pack, if, if our, if our orders were delivered, 
And then their buyer or their owner or whoever opened it up and was like, this isn't what I bought. It wouldn't have worked. So right. yes, I sold off of line sheets with delivery dates that were farther out because the last thing any brand really wants is a lot of inventory. It's just a bad place to be. Mm -hmm. So I knew that. I, I was very aware that I couldn't just pile on inventory. So instead, this gave us a chance to sell product. Uh, let's say we had six shirts we were selling. Maybe maybe one of them just didn't work. Okay, cool. I don't even have to make that. Sell product, have it deliver. But you know, it's it's um it's it's one of those things that you learn in life just in general, which is providing um uh over deliver you know that concept right. of over delivering i never had anybody get our products ever i think i had it one time when we were selling to foot action and that was because we were moving to a new printer get our products and be like bro what's up with this it's not good quality so you have to over deliver because getting into any of these stores is so difficult that mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not you know giving them something of quality um on to the next. So yeah, we were we had we did it a little bit differently where I didn't carry any inventory. And again, that was vital in me having success because if I um, uh, spent too much money on certain collections and those collections didn't move, I would have been dead in the water. So I just set up the business model so we didn't do that. I see. A lot of the people who you know, who watch now, I know they probably follow the direct to consumer route a lot more where they're fulfilling it themselves instead of, you know, selling to boutiques. Do you think that that's a problem? Do you think that's like, you know, a business model that? Oh, I actually think that if you're a brand um, now, I, I think direct to consumer is key, but I think oftentimes people miss the important things about direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I've been in e commerce, fashion e commerce over 15 years, like I said, at Carm Loop early days, 15 years ago. Yeah. And I think that there's a couple pieces that people really miss. Number one, like I said, I advise and work with a lot of different brands. So the first thing I'll do is I'll sit down with them and I'm like, okay, what's your um, conversion rate on your site? And I'm not sure if you, uh, Rich, if you Shopify much, but go on Shopify. That's a fucking big ass number right there. Like yeah, conversion rate. Oftentimes I'll be like, Oh, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know what the conversion rate. I don't know. I'm like, okay, well, if you learn anything about e-commerce, you'll understand that that number is vital. And there's like yeah. some real statistics that'll show you what industry average is. Um, I could talk to them and they have a 7% conversion rate. I'm like, guys, you guys are killing it from a conversion standpoint. You need more of X. Most of the time I talk to people, their conversion rate is lower than it should be. Meaning right. that, hey, guys, you spent a lot of time and a lot of energy and resources to bring people to your site. You did a great job and they're converting less than the industry average. So that's just one thing. But the point I'm making with all of it is that when people start a business, especially if it's a clothing brand or a brand that they're going to sell on e-commerce, you are starting a business. You're not start starting. I make clothes. It's a business. So as a business, what that means you have to learn is through people like you and other great YouTube channels or Shopify tutorials or whatever it may be, you got to learn at least and hopefully more the basics of e-commerce. Like, it's great. You made a cool line. It's great. You made cool denim, whatever. you, Dude, if you don't understand e-commerce, like if you don't take the time, like if you're figuring out how you want your washes on your shirt to be, love it. Are you also figuring out how to do a better job on your online store day in, day out? Because there's so much information out there. You'll find the majority of entrepreneurs don't pay attention to that. And the business aspect of e-commerce is vital. The second thing that I think is so important for people to understand is your next customer, I'm talking about especially e-com, your next customer is no better than your current customer. Your current customer is actually better. They've already declared like, yo, I, you know, I mean, the Hawks are a bad example because they're a professional <laughs> sports team. But if, if, if it was a brand called the Hawks or whatever, and you had bought that hat there, okay, all of a sudden, you, the person that owns the Hawks clothing brand is going to talk to a guy like me and be like, oh, that's cool. It's cool. How do I go get more customers? 
And I'm thinking, well, Rich was just there. How do you get Rich more connected with you? Because, because I can almost guarantee that Rich has other things in his life. I'm not talking family. I'm talking about things he likes, whether it's Marvel or whether it's the NBA or whether it's dirt biking. I don't know what it is. But he's got other things in his life that he feels an emotional connection to better than your line, even though he declared he wanted to buy something from you. So now how do you get Rich that much more connected with the brand as opposed to, yo, how do I go get five more riches? How do I go get Jeff, Jim, you know, Terrence, uh, Mike? No, 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 no. How do you get Rich if he was going to spend $100 with you this year to spend $500 with you? And you do that by cultivating your community. You do that by giving back to your audience in a million different ways and building that connection to your audience. And most people, it's those are the, the two things that I struggle with the most uh, when I'm meeting with new brands. And I'll, I'll do it oftentimes. When I say I advise, I'll do these like lightning sessions where I'll sit with somebody for an hour, talk to them about their brand just to help them out, just to try to just point them in a better direction. And the two things that time and time again I get are, Man, how do I get more people to my website? And again, you need more people. But follow my logic. If you got rich and rich is there and he's hyped on your brand and you get him more hyped and more hyped by doing things, that means when you go get Derek to your site, you can do the things you did with Rich. And now Derek's that much more connected to your site. But what you can't do is just like, yo, yo, I'm going to get people to my site. They get there. All right. They did all right. Okay. Who else can I get? That's not a business that you can really, that, that, that's growing, that you can maintain, that's cultivating an audience. So number one is that, that I struggle with when I'm working with brands. Not, not that I struggle with it. I get the question constantly. I struggle with the fact that they miss some of that. The second part is, dude, is e-commerce, Google things how to run a better email list, how to do more with text messaging, how to increase your conversion rate, do the work, or you're not really a business owner. Like you're having fun with it. Like everybody wants to make fun clothes, bro. Everybody <laughs> wants to make clothes, but the way you make clothes for years and years and years is to figure out how to sell clothes and how to keep people happy so that when they buy your clothes, they, they feel that connection. They want to do more with you. So it's about cultivating that audience, whether it's, any any business anything you know and i think it gets missed with e-commerce especially because you know if you have an ice cream shop down the street right you're like okay how do i get more people here but you're not like yo i gotta get more people here from ohio i'm in mm -hmm. los angeles california you're like how do i cultivate more people here i'm in la I'm, but most importantly they know when you walk in that ice cream shop they're gonna treat you like a little king because they want you to come back they assume you're local Okay, right. but now all of a sudden the world's open up to e-com and what people are thinking is, dude, there's an unlimited amount of people out there. How do I get more and more and more? Okay, yeah, how do you get somebody to your site and have them tethered to you, connected, tell their friends about you? That's how you really win nowadays. I love it, man. Damn, that was deep, dude. <laughs> so you got to love what you got or else you're not going to be grateful for what's coming. So that's, man, that was a lot of game on just like, just in business in general and i've seen you do things just outside of like you know popular demand as well i've seen you do a lot of stuff in media i've seen you i don't know talk to me a little bit about that and how you've like moved forward and you know and use the same you know business strategies in apparel into other types of businesses well every project's a little different right so i i was a creative director on this project called six rings which was uh michael jordan's family offices which uh uh first NFT drop through their company called Air, H-E-I-R. So technically it's basically Michael Jordan's first NFT drop ever. That scenario, totally new ball game for me because I was a cog. I was the person that was the creative director for it. So I had to learn how to play nice and work with all this massive talent that's doing this and doing that with the project and doing this. So that was an incredible learning experience for me. What, one of the things actually, ironically, I've learned a lot in the last few years is I've, uh, for lack of a better term, spread my wings more and got involved in some just really exciting projects is how to work better with a team and work better with talent. And um, that uh, we all kind of pull a different 
part of this. That's been um, really, really exciting for me. And um, I always tell people and always have, I love talent, man. It's part of the reason you and I connected initially is because I had seen Hustle Ninjas and I'm just like, that dude gets it. You know what I mean? Like he's putting out great content. He's super talented. You could tell you're obviously passionate about it. It matters to you. And that's why you've had the success that you had among a million other things, your work ethic and uh, your talent. But at the end of the day, for me, I love talent, man. I love um, working with people that uh, do unique things are willing to, uh, for uh, lack of the term, you know, step outside the box, do something different. And I'm all, always about creating a ruckus. So I love, you know, poking the bear. I love um, uh, causing trouble with stuff. I love to do things that are provocative, evocative. Uh, to me, that stuff, that's, uh, again, the lack of a better term, but that's kind of the spice of life for me. It's like, yeah, it's cool. I can put out this brand, but how do we get people to like stop in their tracks and talk about it? And, and uh, that's all super interesting to me. So for me, uh, obviously, I'm in the NFT space to a degree. I'm learning a lot. Um, and what I'll tell you that everybody, I'm going to not even get into the heady, complicated, nerdy uh, stuff for NFTs. <laughs> but what I would love to challenge everybody with is this. I go to, I, I'm going to be speaking at some NFT events coming up. I've gone to NFT events. I've met a lot of people in the space, both that I've known before and that are new. And all we all know about basically all of these people is that they weren't working on NFTs, NFT projects, anything related to NFTs two to three years ago. Mm -hmm. They weren't at all. True. So when you meet them, when you get to collaborate or talk to them, there's a kinship there. And the kinship I'm talking about is, yo, you're willing to go in the deep end, huh? All right, I'm, going, I'm, I'm willing to go in the deep end too. None of us really know a lot about this stuff. This is all new, but I'm willing to try it. So that's what I think I find most, most interesting about that space, regardless. And again, we don't, it's not ideal for your podcast and we don't have to get into all the technical no, NFT did. stuff, but I think from the NFT standpoint, what you can look at is that's interesting. That guy did an NFT project that really tells you a lot about that person, meaning they're willing to try something different because they weren't doing that three years ago. So, so right. it's, it's real interesting to me as I meet people. And one of the, my favorite things is I'm, if I'm at an event or something, be like, yo, what do you do? Like, what did you do before this? And everybody's <laughs> answer is totally different. No, I love that. I mean, honestly, that's like the perfect transition for the channel because, you know, um, I started a podcast just so we could talk about things just outside of apparel or even branding and whatnot, because the principles of like most businesses, all businesses are practically the same. And, you know, how, how you've taken your knowledge from the apparel game and pretty much put into the NFT space is, is amazing, man. And, you know, just to Thank close you. this, just to close this podcast out, man, let me yeah. know, let me know what's next for Blake. Man, hopefully have fun with whatever I'm working on. Hopefully it involves creative. Hopefully I get a little bit of trouble with whatever I'm doing. <laughs> um, cause a little bit of a ruckus. And uh, for me, I have projects I'm working on. I've had the good fortune of, uh, getting, like I said before, an opportunity to collaborate with a lot of different people, especially recently, right. and an opportunity to have, um, or, and, and to have opportunities come my way. So right. I get to oftentimes pick and choose not only the projects I want to work on, but the people I want to work with. But like I was telling you at the beginning, man, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Like I just am. So for me, I'm always thinking of what's the next thing I, I, I want to put out. What's the next project I want to drop? And I've, uh, I like to just let that sit there so that if I'm out and about or if I hear something from somebody or lightning just strikes, I got an idea. I'm like, oh, I may want to turn that into a business. So for me, the, uh, the future is wide open. I'm going to continue to just do products, uh, work with great people, uh, collaborate with great people, and uh, hopefully help out some people. I mean, I've really tried to do more of that lately, whether it's mentorship or just giving people some advice um, on their businesses, especially in the fashion space. Because man, the one thing I'll tell you about being an entrepreneur, you learn, uh, well, if you're, good, if you're a good entrepreneur, and I'm not saying I'm great, but a good entrepreneur learns from their mistakes. And mm. so if, or other people's mistakes. So if I have 
done something uh, in the past that has negatively impacted my business or myself that I feel, hey, when I'm talking to this young dude, this this girl, whoever it may be that's starting this brand, doing this thing, if I can just be like, hey, no, 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 you don't want to do that. I did that. And here's why you don't want to. That's I love that because uh, I made mistakes oftentimes so other people don't have to. And so I always want to try to continue to give back to uh, anybody that's got an up and coming clothing brand, that's got a new project, that just feels a little stuck or wants some outside advice. So, man, I'm just staying active. You could probably tell that, though. Oh, yeah, I can tell, man. You're a great entrepreneur, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate man. you. So, Blake. You're great at what you do. You're great at what you do. By the way, like I, I got to say, <laughs> the work that you do to me, and obviously you're not the only one, but to me is so amazing that people get to learn for free from obviously you, but also the people you interview. Mm -hmm. I think that if, the, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you're not taking advantage of that and you're not listening to podcasts and you're not learning from all these other people's experiences, mistakes, successes, whatever you want to say, you're missing the boat. So you're doing just tremendous work, man. And I'm sure uh, when you look back in a few years, you're going to be like, you're going to get some emails from people you probably already have being like, yo, man, you inspired me to do this brand or yo, man, like you're, uh, you know, I learned this on there and now I got this clothing line going. So you're doing tremendous work, bro. And I, uh, I'm honored to be on your first show. Thank you, man. Appreciate you, man. So for no anybody who, for anybody who's listening, make sure y'all following Blake, man. He's an awesome human. Um, appreciate y'all for listening to the Hustle Ninjas podcast. Make sure y'all are following it, liking it. I, I'm new to the podcast world. Make sure y'all are following it and sharing it on the podcast streaming services. So, um, as far as YouTube, make sure y'all comment, like, subscribe. We're going to catch y'all next time. Thank you for listening to the Hustle Ninjas podcast. We hope you enjoyed. Be sure to give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast listening platform. And we'll see you here next time. Keep hustling. Keep hustling.